Hi, this is Dr. Polito, and this is the Biology Majors Lecture on DNA Structure and Function. We're going to cover the history of the genetic material, we're going to go through its structure, its replication and repair mechanisms, and then finally how it's packaged in the nucleus. Now, story begins in the early 1900s. All right, by this point in time, we know that there is this mysterious substance inside the eukaryotic nucleus. We used to call it nucleon, um, and then we moved on and realizing it was acidic, and so we called it nucleic acid. This was all discovered in the early, I'm sorry, in, the, uh, in 1869 by a guy named uh, Miescher. Miescher discovered it in 1869. And he called it nucleon, okay? And then he realized it was acidic, and that became nucleic acid. But it wasn't until the early 1900s when a biochemist up in uh, Rochester, New York, named Levine, pictured over here, he, uh, he was a biochemist. He discovered that DNA was actually made out of uh, the building blocks we call uh, nucleotides now. He actually... Uh, named them nucleotides and we use them to this day <clears throat> and so nucleotides he also incorrectly postulated and that's why we say we're so wrong the initial model of what dna actually was the nucleic acid was this thing he called a tetranucleotide and so this tetranucleotide model um first postulated by phoebus over here um which you can see the structure that he postulated over here um this was wrong, of course, we now know in retrospect, but here's the key. Because we thought DNA was this very mundane, boring, did-nothing molecule, we assumed that the genes that Mendel first discovered, Mendel's factors that Morgan then landed on chromosomes, and then we figured out that chromosomes are made out of DNA and proteins, we assumed for decades that genes were actually made of proteins because proteins are made out of 20 amino acids while DNA and RNA are only made of four nucleotides, right? And so if you were given the choice between a language that had 20 letters versus four letters, and I told you to pick one and then go make the world, of course you would pick the one with more diversity, right? So. As I said earlier, by, by, the 19, by 1915, researchers knew that genes were on chromosomes. They even knew they, uh, they even mapped them. So the next question was what they're made out of. And uh, we knew that whatever it was, whatever the genetic material was, it had to meet certain criteria. It had to be able to store information, replicate with high fidelity, and undergo occasional mutations, right? And so, as I said, the working assumption was it was made of protein. Now we're going to go over three key experiments in the early works of uh, the, the, the quest for the genetic material. Okay, and so there was these three key experiments we're going to learn about that demonstrated Mendel's mysterious factors were in fact DNA and not protein or RNA. So Fred Griffith was uh, born in Hale, uh, Lancashire, up in uh, Britain. And, uh, you know, he was a geneticist. He studied genetics early on. <clears throat> and to be honest, I'm not really sure what kind of stuff they studied. They probably did a lot of observational work back then. And um, by, by the early 1900s, right, so World War I broke out, and his, uh, not hospital, but his small little dinky laboratory was taken over by the government and um, in an effort, you know, for the war, and one of the things he was uh, assigned was to work on a vaccine for pneumonia, which was killing people in, in the thousands, hundreds of thousands. And so in, his, in the course of his work, one of the uh, serendipitous controls that he ran in his experiments on mice um, turned out to usher in the modern era of genetics. So he published these findings in 1928. And this is how it worked. 
So the bacteria he was studying, there were many different types of it. So you can type these things, and so you can say there was type 1, there's type 2, there's type 3. <clears throat> okay, now the details of this, the microbiology, the complexity behind this, this is beyond the scope of this lecture. So for now, we're just going to imagine that there's two basic kinds of bacteria, okay? There's type S and there's type R. The reason it's called type S is because when you grow it on a Petri dish, the cultures that it forms are very smooth looking. Whereas the type R, the harmless strain, has rough uh, has a rough phenotype. Okay, so the key here is these these letters indicate the phenotypes. All right, now what's really going on here under the microscope is if you have a bacterial cell, it'll have a capsule, a sugar coating, if you will, around it. Okay, and so the smooth bacteria was smooth because it had this capsule. All right. It also protected the bacteria from the host's immune system. All right. And so the reason why it was so lethal was the body was unable to fight it. It was unable to attack it. Whereas the R bacteria had no code. And so it was very easily destroyed by the host's immune system. The following is an example of many similar experiments which I have made to discover whether an avirulent onomococcus could be transformed into the virulent S form by growth in the body of the mouse. This is a quote from Fred Griffith from 1928, his original paper. And so what he did in the first experiment here, let's uh, start with his control. So we verify the lethality of the strains. So here we are taking the smooth bacteria, as you can see uh, annotated in red here, and when, when mice were injected uh, with this bacteria, they died a few days later. In contrast, when you infect the mice with the R strain, the R strain, they don't die. Okay? So, in the next experiment, okay, we're going to take the S bacteria and we're going to heat kill it. Okay? Basically, the way you heat kill something is you put it over an open flame and you heat it to some certain uh, temperature for a certain amount of time. And of course, you know, in the course of these experiments, they did very different temperatures over very different times. And so you can find that if you heat kill this, the mice, unsurprisingly, don't die. Now, in one of the control experiments of his original work, this is where something shocked him. He took living, non-lethal, rough bacteria, and he mixed it with a good heaping dose of dead S bacteria. And when he infected the mouse with that, the mouse died. But the most surprising thing was when you take the blood from the heart and you purify the bacteria out of it, the bacteria were actually the S type. Okay, so now at the time, you have to understand that in the microbiology world, types were immutable. You had the type, different types of, of bacteria, and that's what they were. They were like species. You couldn't convert one to the other. It's a little ridiculous. So these experiments, um, he was a very thoughtful, contemplative, very, very um, uh, diligent, with a keen eye for detail, researcher. And so he, when in the original paper, you can see him checking every single possible control you can think of, right? He was convinced at first that there was some contamination of a little bit of the S bacteria that survived, but they did the, they did the controls and it turned out that this was actually happening. And you know, just like any good scientific story, when he published this, others eventually were able to repeat his work to the point where Griffith's um, principle of transformation became very well known in the field. All right, so this is a good, just basic summary of the experiment. You take a mouse and you inject it with S bacteria, they die. You infect it with R, they don't die. You heat inactivate it, they don't die. But when you mix the dead S and the live R, they die. And what's more, you recover living S. Okay? So, um, the one thing he was unable to do was repeat any of this kind of transformation in a test tube. Okay. In his original paper, he said he failed. He tried putting it into test tubes and getting it to work that way, and he couldn't do it. All right. So he had finally uh, uncovered, though, this notion of being able to change the phenotype. And if you can change a phenotype, 
you're changing the genotype, right? So the question became, what is this stuff? What is this transforming factor? Now, Avery, as pictured right here, Avery was a researcher in America, and when he first caught wind of Griffith's experiments, he didn't believe it. He thought it was a contamination. Um, and actually, uh, Avery came down with quite a bad uh, sickness, and in his absence, the people in his lab were able to repeat the work of Griffith to the point where they convinced Avery. <clears throat> okay, so um, one of the biggest little breakthroughs, which you're not going to read about in probably in any book because it's not that that important of a detail, but I think it really is uh, a bridge between Griffith and Avery, is that in 1931, uh, Dawson and Sia published a report that showed what Griffith couldn't do, that they could repeat the work in vitro. Okay, and by doing this in vitro, you have to understand when you do an experiment in vivo, okay, in vivo means literally in life, um, which is what he was doing with mice, you have to understand that when you do an in vivo experiment, there's a lot of stuff going on inside a living body that we can't control or even understand. All right, so being able to replicate it in vitro, which literally means in glass, all right, and what's that's what test tubes were made up at the time. They didn't make them out of plastic back then. And so by being able to set it up in vitro, you can control every single aspect, every single condition and environmental variable, and then you can do much more diligent work, right? So Avery and then his two colleagues, uh, McLeod and McCarty, were able to show after 16 years of work that Griffith's transforming factor was in fact DNA, all right? Now, Avery himself didn't win a Nobel Prize, but you can see he was a pretty highly decorated guy. Um, and to this day, the uh, it's said in, in the stories when you read about that one of the biggest regrets that the Nobel Committee have is not awarding Avery um, a medal for a Nobel. Um, and the reason is, is his work really set such an important stage for the modern story of DNA, where we have, uh, especially uh, with Watson and Crick and Wilkins and uh, Franklin's story, um, without Avery's work, people would have still been bickering about if it was DNA or protein. All right. As you can see, a picture here, that's uh, McCarty meeting Watson and Crick at some dinner party. Looks like probably in the 1960s, um, because at the time, uh, Ah, at the time, uh, Watson, who you can see here, he looks a little older now, but when he first discovered DNA, he was in his 20s. So this picture looks like it's probably may maybe early 70s, late 60s. In any case, how did Avery do this? Well, this is how they this is how they did it. Once they were able to establish it in vitro, okay, the you know first they get rid of all the, the lipids and carbohydrates, all right. They um, use this heat killed S then, and so they then separate it out into three basic vials, right. So in this vial, they add a protease, okay, um, and what proteases do? They're enzymes that basically shred DNA. Um, did I just say shred DNA? They shred protein. And so you would expect that if this transforming substance was protein, this would stop it in its tracks, right? But no, the protease was still able to transform RNAs. And the same was true for an enzyme that was able to shred RNA, but not an enzyme that shredded DNA, all right? DNA was able to inhibit the transformation. And so this work, this pivotal work, showed that the transforming substance, at least in bacteria, was in fact DNA. All right. So here's another slide showing um, the basics of the stories. And in this case, you can see how the, the smooth cells still have their, their proteinaceous coat, um, their, their capsule. Um, right. So the summary of their work was that we S transforms R, that neither the proteases nor the RNases prevent transformation, but DNS, DNA does prevent it, and that whatever this transforming substance is, it turned out uh, when they biochemically separated, it was huge. And if it was, it was so huge that if it was in fact DNA, there would need to be 1,600 nucleotides. Okay. 
All right, now here's the thing. While this evidence itself was overwhelming, a lot of people still didn't accept it. All right, scientists need a lot of evidence before they believe anything. But also, there's two other things going on here. One is that when Avery published his work, he was very cautious in his conclusions. He didn't assert himself in the way some other scientists do. And the second thing was we still didn't really know what nucleic acid was too much. And we still had very much the tetranucleotide model embedded in the uh, scientific culture which, as you remember, it's just a very boring ATCG repeated over and over and over again um, from Levine. And people who tried to parse out the different pieces, the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's, they weren't able to get it very accurately. And so, really, if anything, those early works showed that each one was about 25%, which would, in fact, confirm the tetranucleotide model. Okay? So people were still doing experiments to determine what the genetic material was, right? And they also, it just made no sense that it was DNA. There were 20 amino acids and there were only four nucleotides, right? So that's what it comes down to. Now, Levine had a really good excerpt in his book that he published in uh, 1931 on nucleic acid. Remember, this is the guy that discovered um, nucleotides and postulated the tetranucleotide model. He said, the chemistry of nucleic acids can be summed up very briefly. Indeed, a few graphic formulas, which need not fill even a single printed page, might suffice to express the entire story, store, sorry, the entire store of our present day knowledge on the subject, right? So we knew nothing about these things. So the proof finally came in a really, really elegant experiment by Hershey and Chase um, in 1952. And what they did was they used a very simple model, um, uh, a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, um, to, to basically show all this, right? So here's bacteriophage T2. And you can see in its structure, it almost looks like a moon lander, where the outer casing, which we call the capsid, is made out of protein, and the inner core is made out of DNA, all right? Now, here's the key. This is what was so ingenious about it. The uh, DNA nucleotides are known to be very, very rich in phosphorus, all right? And very, very poor in sulfur. In contrast, proteins are very, very rich in sulfur and very poor in phosphorus, right? And so we take two radioactive isotopes of these elements, P32 and S35. All right, that's what we're going to use in our little toolkit here. And so, well, here, so I'll tell you what, let, let's walk through this. What they did was they took the phages, okay, and they took a culture of bacteria, right, and they grew it in either S35 or they took a culture and they grew it in P32. P, oops, P32. 32. All right, so if you have a bunch of bacteria in here with some radioactive S35, all right, and you infect them with some T2, and you let them sit there for, you know, a couple of days, the radio, the phages that come out of this, the T2 that come out of this, are going to be radioactive in their proteins, right? And so you can picture their, um, their capsid, the outside shelling, right? That's going to have the S35, and it's going to be radioactive. Okay. Alternatively, if you grow T2 in the presence of P32, then the phages that come out of that are going to have their core radioactive. <coughs> right? So this is how they did it. After they, they propagated these viruses, these, these phages, they then took uh, bacterial cells, so here's a bacterial cell, and they infected them. So you can see the viruses will bind to the outside of the cell, right? And then they let a few hours pass, long enough where they would inject their heritable material. And then they would actually put the uh, combination of these in a blender, and it was a special really high-speed blender, uh, which was common in the kitchen. Actually, uh, th there's a video of Hershey talking about this that I watched the other day, where he um, he's holding this household blender that usually used to make uh, cocktails or something, and it was powerful enough to knock the phages off the cell. That's the key, okay? Knocking these phages off the cell so that after they knock them off, they can then centrifuge them, 
all right? And in the centrifuge container, the bacterial cells, which are relatively, you know, much, much larger, orders of magnitude larger, they would form the pellet in the centrifuge, whereas the viruses would be these tiny little ducts in what's called the supernatant, okay? The supernatant is a liquid component of a centrifugation, right? And so then they asked a very simple question, where's the radiation? And it turned out when they infected the bacteria with viruses that had S35, right? None of that protein was found to be, well, not a, I should say, a not a significant amount was found inside the cell, right? In contrast, when they did the vice versa of this, right? Now we can see the bacteria injecting radiation into the bacteria. I'm sorry, the, we can see the phage injecting radiation into the bacteria, right? And what's more, if we let these bacteria move on and grow, the subsequent virus particles actually have radioactive phosphorus integrated into their core, into their DNA. And so this asserted that it was the DNA and not the protein that was being injected into the bacteria, causing the infection, and therefore DNA, not protein, was the heritable material. So here's a wonderful micrograph of a uh, bacterial cell being infected with the, the T2, right? So you can see there's the capsid, and you can see there's the extension into, uh, that, that's gonna to inject the DNA inside, right? So this is an electron micrograph. And there's Hershey at his bench in the, uh, the late 50s. Okay, so those are the three big experiments. You got Griffith, you got Avery, McCarty, and McLeod, and you have Hershey and Chase. All right, so to sum it all up here, here are little quotes from each of their original papers. Griffith, an application of the principles underlying these observations to the question of transformation of one type into another has given results of considerable interest. Very humble. Now, Avery, as I said earlier, he was even more humble. The evidence presented supports the belief that a nucleic acid of the deoxyribose type, which is DNA, is the fundamental unit of the transforming principle of pneumococcus type 3. And then lastly, Hershey and Chase said, we infer that sulfur-containing protein has no function in phage multiplication and that DNA has some function, right? So the reason I'm showing this to you particularly for those of you who are going into science, right? If you remember talking about the scientific method and we say that science isn't out to prove things, science either supports or refutes, okay? And so here are three really good examples of the conclusions we make from very pivotal work. And yet they're not saying we proved X, right? It is definitely DNA. You can see how cautious we are when we say things, right? And that's why um, when we actually do solve problems in science over the years, we can get more and more confident in the conclusions. Okay, now here's another interesting little quote from Avery. So you have to remember, at this point in time, the tetranucleotide model was the going word, right? And so he says, if the results of the present study on the chemical nature of the transforming principle are confirmed, the nucleic acids must be regarded as possessing biological specificity, the chemical basis of which is yet to be determined. Right? So basically, in other words, she's saying Levine has to be wrong. The tetranucleotide model is inconsistent with the current understanding. Okay? This is how hypotheses and theories work. Here we have this working theory, the tetranucleotide theory, which they assumed from 1909 until here we are, 1948. So the first half of the first century of the, the 20th century, we thought very incorrectly that DNA was this boring molecule that had no interest, right? And so now here we have the first glimmer that maybe it does have something interesting going on, right? And so, um, by around this time, 
we have that challenge still on the table, right? What percentage of the sample is a given nucleotide? And so Levine's early attempts, as I said earlier, showed that the, each of the four were about 25%, right? But now we have Erwin Shargaff, who, using very new techniques in chromatography and um, uh, purifying the nucleotides, was able to be very, very precise in his uh, experiments, right? So up to this point, we knew two facts about DNA, that it was in the nucleus of every cell, and then it consisted of two bases. Okay, now this is the point that some people will, might have a little bit of uh, trouble with because we're always talking about A, T, C, and G, okay? But reduce that, reduce that. One is a purine, which is a five carbon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a two, two ring molecule, right? With some nitrogens in there. And the other, so this was the purine, right? And then there's pyrimidine, which is just one ring, okay? Now these are rich in, uh, I think it's on the one and the three of uh, th the nitrogens. And then some of these will either have a hydroxyl here, I think there's a nitrogen here and here. Um, in any case, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, this is pyrimidine versus purine, okay? And so there were two bases um, inside the nucleus, right? And so the purines are A and G, adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines are the uh, thymine and the cytosine, right? And so what Shargaff did was he was able to purify nuclei from cells, right? Isolate the DNA. And then what he did was he was able to take that DNA right and he was able to break it down into its components its constituent nucleic acids right the monomers <clears throat> and then what was it able to do and this is the new thing was he was able to separate it using chromatography okay and so if you remember there were some labs we did where we have a piece of paper and we can separate things in that way right and so by being able to take the total amount of dna right and then separate it out into different components, you can then use other techniques. So in the case of exposing each of these components to UV light, it turned out each nucleotide was able to absorb the UV in a slightly different wavelength. So he was able to tell exactly what percentage of the original sample was A or G or T or C, right? And it and so he was able to really, really test that hypothesis. The tetranucleotide model had a very simple uh, test. It was either 25% across the board or it wasn't, right? And sure enough, he showed very consistently that the concentration, the percentage of these was not even, right? And there were two very interesting observations that came out of his work, and we call these Shargaff's rules. The first is, is that the amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine, and that the amount of guanine is always equal to the amount of cytosine, okay? <clears throat> and this was constant within a given species. So if you take any human and you sample its DNA, you'll always get about 31% of A, and about 31% of T, right? This is with an experimental error. And then about, you could say about, what, 18.8 uh, as an average there. So, so within a given species, it was consistent. But between species, it was variant. That was the interesting part. Right? And so knowing nothing about the structure of DNA, knowing nothing about how it's put together in the cell, we're able to finally disprove the tetranucleotide model, the idea that it's this boring molecule. Now it's got some interest to it, right? There's something here that's interesting. Now here's the key. Shargaff didn't really know what he just stumbled on. He wasn't able to conclude anything about the what we know now as A base pairing with T and G base pairing with C. He didn't know that, right? He didn't have any concept. He wasn't a biochemist in that sense. He didn't do structure. He, did, he wasn't a, uh, a crystallographer. He didn't know, he wasn't even thinking about that, right? But it was this little nugget of knowledge 
that he did pass on to those who discovered it that would help them solve the riddle. Okay, you can see here in some of his original work, um, you can see the ratios here: the the adenine to the guanine, the thymine to the cytosine. All right, so here's the basic key. If you want to um, uh, talk about the math here, if you're given an A, you're given a percentage of A. Let's say it's uh, you know what, 19 percent. Okay, sure. You and you're you're asked to derive the rest of it. Okay, the simplest way to do it, all right, is to take the two opposite ones and subtract 50 from the number you got, right? So the uh, so 50 minus 19 that's 31 percent, and now you know that T is always 19, and now you know G is 31, right? So this is Shargaff's rules. <coughs> And uh, I guess the last thing I want to say here is that his work made DNA a little bit more credible of a candidate. So combine Shargaff with Hershey and Chase and Avery and McCarty and McLeod, and you have a really strong case that the hereditary material is DNA. Now we get to the interesting story. Okay. The woman you're seeing here, this is Rosalind Franklin. She was an X-ray crystallographer. <coughs> she helped deduce the structure of the double helix of DNA. And um, so in most history books or most textbooks, she's given just this tiny little footnote that she made a picture that helped Watson and Crick discover their double helix. But the story is so much more interesting. Um, it turned out if Rosalind was given just a few more weeks of work, and she wasn't impeded in moving labs, she would have absolutely come up with the double helix completely on her own based on her own analysis of her pictures of her extra crystallography. Okay, now just to give you a little, uh, a little, um, uh, mini lecture on extra crystallography. So imagine you have a piece of film, okay, and then you have a crystal sitting in front of the film. All right, and now you can take an x-ray gun and you can shoot x-rays at it, pew. And what the x-rays do is they scatter, okay? They scatter in a very specific pattern. Understand this, the crystal that you're dealing with, understand that a crystal at the molecular level, okay, and I'm just drawing a box to represent a crystal, is whatever, whatever the crystal is made out of, so in this case, DNA, the pieces of the crystal are all in exactly the same molecular configuration, the same orientation, so that if you shoot them with an electron gun or a, an x-ray gun, the diffraction pattern you're going to get is going to give you hints of the actual 3D shape of those elements. Okay? Okay, so there's two ways to model a molecule. So back in the day, you can even you can either be an experimentalist, which is what Roslyn was doing, and Roslyn was very, very hesitant to build models with, in the absence of good structural data. Watson and Crick, on the other hand, Watson and Crick decided to throw together a model. They were spitballing it in a way. They were putting it together, um, and part of the reason was they had a fire under their feet. <coughs> So there's another scientist named uh, Linus Pauling, who was a very famous biochemist, uh, an American. He was in California at the time, um, uh, and, and Pauling was, uh, he did a lot of the early work in protein structure. He's the one that f discovered the alpha helix, for example, uh, in protein structure. And so he was working on a manuscript and putting together a model of DNA but he had it wrong. He was going with a triple helix, right? Now his son was working in England at the time, and his son had an unpublished manuscript of the paper, and he did share it with Watson, um, <coughs> who then went to Crick and said, okay, uh, th the Americans are working on this. I really, really think we should make this priority. And so they were given the okay to go ahead and build their structure, okay? And they actually um, were in contact with uh, Wilkins and Rosalind. So Wilkins was another researcher, a colleague of Franklin. And between Wilkins and Franklin, um, they were both working on X-ray crystallography of the A form of DNA and the B form of DNA. 
and um, it turns out Wilkins was working on the one that would go on to show the double helix more clearly. <clears throat> Roslyn, for all of her work, didn't really believe that DNA was actually a double helix. Um, and you can actually see in her um, in her notebook here. <clears throat> oh, I'll tell you what. There's um, a bunch of stuff here that I actually threw together, and um, this is my first time really talking out loud about it. So forgive that. Uh, this is a little jumbled here, but um, so so what you're seeing here is a part of a letter that she actually received, um, basically pulling her away from working on <laughs> solutions of proteins. I think in in uh, moving into the fibers of DNA. And uh, I just love the, the understatement here. Um, as you no doubt know, nucleic acid is an extremely important constituent of cells, and it seems to us that it would be very valuable if this could be followed up in detail. We do feel that the work on fibers would be more immediately profitable and perhaps fundamental. Right? And so you can see here, these are this is actually taken um, right out of Rosalind's notebook. The, uh, the Welcome uh, website has all of her stuff scanned in, the originals, and I was kind of leafing through some of her work, and you can see here um, some of the... So these aren't the original... Uh, th this this is just the closer version of it. But, but the reason I'm showing you this is you can see that each one of the images that she was generating from the x-rays um, well, were very different from each other. Right? And what's just amazing to me is that by by looking at these pictures, you can infer 3D shapes of things. Um, so uh, here's here's some other samples from her notebook. You can see here, there's the uh, molecular structure of adenine and thymine, and you can see the modeling of the, uh, the hydrogen bonds between them, right? Now, they weren't exactly right. So you can see here, um, uh, guanine and cytosine, they actually, there's actually three uh, hydrogen bonds. <clears throat> um, so I'm not quite sure, uh, I'm, I'm no biochemist myself, but, um, and I didn't read up on this before uh, narrating this, um, but I can tell you that th this is where they were back in the day, right? They were still modeling the basic, basics here. And this, this is Linus Pauling's uh, postulated triple helix, all right? And now here's the cool part. <clears throat> you see here, he has it modeled so that the sugars and the phosphates are on the inside and that the, oops, sorry, and that the bases are on the outside, okay? Now, the reason why the bases are on the outside in these early models, and actually Watson and Crick originally modeled their um, uh, base pairs on the outside too, is because the idea was if this is the molecule of heredity, if this is the gene, then enzymes or some other molecules had to be able to read this somehow, right? So the it made no sense that they would be hidden on the inside, that they had to be read by being bound to on the outside. I mean, you can't read a book with the cover shut, right? So it turns out, no, you got to open the pages, and that's actually how DNA works. But well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. All right. And so this is another fun one. This was uh, an advertisement of the X-ray diffraction tube that I'm guessing Rosalind's group eventually bought. But the key here was that it was able to get really, really, really much closer to the samples. And so the, as it says here, the focal spot size was um, really, really tight, right? So here's the thing, Rosalind and Wilkins were generating some of the best X-ray crystallography pictures, uh, photographs uh, um, in the world. And that, that's what they did. Right, but again and again, <laughs> this is Rosalind Franklin's original notebook. So you can see here, she, um, the, the skull and crossbones uh, was what she actually doodled that in there because she wrote here, you know, next layer sits on top, giving maximum Van der Waals energy. Three chain arrangement involves a twist, therefore helix. No, she did not like the helix at all. And on the left here, you can see kind of a joke. All right, now here's the thing. Rosalind and uh, Wilkins did not get along. They they were very, and actually it turns out uh, Franklin didn't get along with people in general. And there's a video of Watson talking about their interactions. And he said, and I don't know the veracity of this claim, but he said that she actually had um, Asperger's. And that's part of the reason why she was so difficult to get along with. So here it is, uh, her and her, um, her, her, 
younger colleague, Gosling, um, wrote this kind of a joke uh, and, and kind of poked fun at Wilkins here. It is with great regret that we have to announce the death on Friday, the 18th of July, 1952, of DNA the helix. Now, the key here is this crystalline. Okay, the crystalline would be um, the crystalline. Uh, would be uh, Wilkins' form of it. So remember that she was working on the A version of DNA and Wilkins was working on the B form of DNA, right? And she was working, she was starting to get convinced that A was a helix, but she did not think they both were. And so here she is saying that the death of uh, the DNA helix, the crystalline version, death followed a protracted illness, which an intensive course of, uh, it says, Vesselized injections. Um, Vesselization is part of the math they use to interpret the data. Um, so, with an intensive course of vesselized injections had failed to relieve, a memorial service will be held next Monday or Tuesday. It is hoped that Dr. MHF Wilkins will speak in memory of the late helix. Right? Wilkins was convinced it was in fact a helix, which is why this is kind of a funny little uh, little tidbit of history here. And uh, if you want, you can click on this link here. This actually goes to our notebook, and you can get a, a deeper insight into it all. <clears throat> um, on the bottom here, I always thought this this is interesting too. This looks like the tetranucleotide model, um, or she's actually she, what she's probably doing here is modeling some kind of early helix um, where the uh, the sugars. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, again, this isn't my kind of my kind of stuff. I just I just find this kind of story endlessly fascinating. Um, so here's here's famous uh, the famous photo fifty one. Okay, so she um, she did finally present this. Now November fifty one. This was uh, about six months before Watson and Crick published their work. But um, so here's what happened. Watson visits Wilkins in his lab. Okay, by that point in time. Franklin had left. She was moving labs. And so Wilkins inherited all of her work. He had all of her plates. Um, and so when Watson came to visit, and by the way, so Watson's a 23 year old uh, young hotshot American. Watson comes into Wilkins' lab and uh, Wilkins shows him this picture. <clears throat> and because Watson and Crick were, you know, they, they were experts also at reading these, these sorts of things, uh, or at least uh, I know Crick was, I'm not sure about Watson, but um, you can see here that um, just by looking at this beautiful picture, you can infer a lot of things. Um, now, we can't, and I, I still struggle um, understanding what exactly we're looking at here, but one, one of the things is uh, that's interesting here is uh, there's 10 of these little ladder things. These are the bases. These are these are the base pairs actually. And so the distance between these, this is the this is where the uh, 0.34 nanometers was derived from and the overall 3.4 uh, for the twist. All right, so what you're seeing here, if I can just kind of loosely superimpose this, is the double helix here where you have the bases stacked up against like that. All right, so this picture told Watson and Crick that it was in fact a double helix and that the bases were on the inside. And so that key piece of insight, it just took them a few more weeks to hammer it out and boom, they managed to build this model of DNA, the double helix. And now here's the thing, within the first five years of that publication, uh, nobody really took much notice of it. It wasn't until it was confirmed and uh, other work was done before it really was impacted on what exactly that they discovered. And so by 62, <clears throat> um, they won the Nobel Prize and uh, uh, Wilkins earned it with them. Um, and unfortunately, by this point, Rosalind had passed away from ovarian cancer at the young age of uh, 37. And uh, from what I was reading about this, she, when she was convalescing in her some of her earlier recovery work, she, um, I think she, she had made friends with Watson's um, wife, and so she actually was um, recovering at their house for a little while. So, but in any case, she was not awarded the Nobel Prize because they're not awarded posthumously. Um, interestingly, though, who's missing here <clears throat> is Shargaff, right? Shargaff, 
is missing, even though he was a huge contributor to some of the understanding here. And actually, Shargaff, uh, when he found out he didn't win the prize, he was really, really angry, and he ended up writing letters to like all the world scientists complaining about why he was snubbed for the Nobel Prize on this. Okay, so that information that was confirmed by Franklin's X-ray crystallography showed that DNA is in fact a two-stranded helix. The sugar phosphate backbone goes along the outside. The width itself, the width of the helix, so from here to here, is two nanometers. That the spacing of the bases uh, in between, so each of these stacks, this is 0.34 nanometers. So that one overall twist of the DNA is 3.4. Okay. Now the other thing that's not usually mentioned in uh, introductory textbooks, but it's worth noting here, is that DNA is actually, it's an asymmetrical helix. So you can see here, this area and this area, you'll see the distance between here and here is a little bit tighter than the distance between here and here, right? And so DNA turns out to actually have a minor groove and a major groove, okay? Um, but that's not something you're going to ever be worrying about until you get up into the higher levels of molecular biology. All right, so here we are. This is the Watson Crick DNA model. Okay, now it's important to understand when I say the Watson Crick DNA model, it's the correct one. This is the one that's correct. It's not their earlier work where they incorrectly thought the bases faced out. Okay, so here we are, the, the bases are on the inside. <clears throat> okay, so. The strands themselves are anti-parallel. What's that mean? Well, if you take this, that's a nucleic acid. Here's one nucleotide, here's another nucleotide, here's another nucleotide, right? You can see, so here's a nucleotide. Notice, so here's the sugar, okay? Here's the three prime carbon and it's facing down and here's the five prime carbon going up. So you would say that overall, this is the five prime uh, end, and this is the three prime end, so it's running this way. If you look at the other side, notice it's upside down, right? Here's the three prime carbon, here's the five prime carbon. And so this one is running this way, and this run, one is running that way. So we call this anti-parallel. Alright, this is going to give us a huge headache when we learn about how DNA actually replicates. The other thing is the diameter is uniform, and the reason for that is you have one purine interacting with one pyrimidine. Right, And so one way to think of this is there's always got to be three total rings across the entire uh, diameter, right? So basically a big one and a little one. And so you can understand now if, um, you know, if, if it was A binding with A, you would get, uh, you know, like a bump in the helix, right? Because the A's are the big ones and or uh, you know or g's and if it was a t or a c it would actually you know pinch in a little bit right and so it turns out uh, that it's always a big one and a little one a purine and a pyrimidine All right now even though the base pairing themselves are very very strict right you don't ever get an a pairing with a you know with a t or a c <clears throat> the actual orientation of the vertical sequence could be in any order, right? So this is a TA base pair, this is a GC base pair, this is a CG base pair, this is an AT. And so we read DNA in terms of base pairs or, you know, BP. <clears throat> so, so for example, this, you would call this a, a four BP, you know, a four base pair fragment of DNA. But the key is, is this, is we can read it, you can put it together, in any order. You can put anything here. So this could have been a T. You know, and of course if that was a T then this would be an A. And you know, make this a T and this was an A. So this ordering is, you know, there's no limit to the possibility. You can basically, you know, if we oriented it this way, we can imagine just, you can just start writing, right? There's no um, relationship between this and this. Or, yeah, oops, let me go. Oh, I can't undo that. Ugh. Or uh, let's see. So there's no relationship between this and this, or this and this. You can put them in any order you want. Okay? Just like English. So, okay. So let's stop. Right, here's just a, a nice little diagram showing why you can't have two purines or two pyrimidines uh, put together <clears throat> that there's a consistent width 
And uh, again, this is consistent with the x-ray data, right? If you go back to uh, photo 51 here, right, you can see this, oops, hmm, where'd my, uh, I have to get my uh, little pointer back here, where's my, my pen? Okay, you can see here, there's, there's a very nice, very resolved, even structure here. Right, there's no variance to that, and so you can um, you can infer from this that the uh, the diameter is uh, especially the fact that these are so dark, this overexposure. So that would tell you there's repeating units, you know. And so the, what that is is you know as the DNA snakes along, you know you get you can stack things up going along that way, and uh, so this this tells you it's uh, an even diameter. <clears throat> All right, and so here, here are the bases themselves. You can see the the pyrimidines, okay, and the purines, right? So again, purines are the big ones. And one way to think of it is the, the word itself, purine. It's a strong word, right? It just it's very guttural. The purines versus the pyrimidines, and you can almost feel like mumbling that. So like this is the weaker, the smaller one, and the purines are the big ones, right? And because we're always talking about adenine, right? We talk about ATP for a couple of weeks, right? So adenine are, is a purine, and then um, you know that A pairs with T, right? And then perhaps you can just associate, uh, maybe remember AG, uh, you know, like maybe a, a attorney general or maybe, you know, uh, uh, the atomic uh, number or the atomic abbreviation for silver. <clears throat> so you have adenine and guanine or the purines. You're not going to be expected to be able to doodle these, to draw these in structures, okay? But keep keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of nitrogens in here. So these are bases. These are al uh, alkaline, right? When you drop this, <coughs> excuse me, when you drop this in water, it's going to act as a base. It's going to, you know, increase the pH. And now you might be thinking, well, wait, wait, but, but DNA stands for deoxynucleic acid. Well, if these are bases, then what gives with the acid part? Well, if you go back to the structure here, you see all this right these phosphates these are very acidic okay and so these are more acidic than these are alkaline and so the net is a drop in the ph when you dump ph uh, when you dump dna in a an aqueous solution so that's why it's an acid okay all right uh let's see what other interesting things can we well so one of the things that's not listed here right now is uracil right and you probably remember that uracil replaces thymine in RNA. But here's a clever little thing. All uracil is, right, is if I take this methyl group here and I erase it, that becomes uracil. Okay, so so that's now uracil. So so uracil is, or so rather, so thymine is essentially methylated uracil. So once we understand what a nucleotide is, and we can talk about the overall higher order structure of the nucleic acid. On the left here, you can see two individual nucleic acids. Okay, and when we talk about a nucleic acid, we're talking about one chain of nucleotides, right? So you can see one, two, three, four different nucleotides on that side, and you can see the different nucleotides on the other side. Um, you can see the blue rectangle here is highlighting the sugar phosphate backbone. You can see a phosphate, then a sugar, then a phosphate, then a sugar. All right. You can see the individual base pairings, the adenine and the thymine and the cytosine and the guanine. You can tell that the adenine is longer, that's a purine, and thymine is shorter, that's a pyrimidine. You can see the different carbons that the uh, various constituents of the nucleic, nucleic acid, uh, rather the nucleotide, are bound to. So you can see that the phosphate is bound to the phi prime. You can see that the phosphate of one nucleotide is bound to the three prime of the next. All right, so get an intuition here of what you're looking at. You can see individual nucleotides, right? And that's the vision that you want to establish. The last thing here is you can see the five prime end and the three prime end, right? The five prime and the three prime end. And you can see that they're opposites, right? 
the anti-parallel nature of the double helix. On the left here, versus the right here, you can see that when you flatten out the nucleic acid, uh, uh, the, the, the double helix, you flatten it out, you see it's a ladder. And then what we do is we take this and we twist it. And you can see we form this double helix. The other interesting thing is, is that the helix itself has a small or a minor groove and a major groove, and that has to do with the, um, I believe it has to do with that bond right there. This is not an actual perfectly fit bond in reality. It's, it's a little uh, bent, and so that leads to the overall helix being a little twisted. All right, there are 10 base pairs per turn. The turn itself is 3.4 nanometers. The distance between these is 0.34 nanometers. The radius is one nanometer. The diameter, therefore, is two nanometers, and it's even, okay? And just another view of the helix for your studying. And another, the important thing you need to do is, as I said earlier, establish a vision. Be able to understand what you're looking at and understand how things fit together, all right? And so you can see on this diagram here, there's basically three different representations. On the left, it's the simplest you can get a little bit more complicated and then you can get all the way down to the details of the actual chemical structure down to the individual nitrogens okay all right so as i said earlier we got nucleotides sugar phosphate and then nitrogenous base right the purines are adenine and guanine the pyrimidine pyrimidine pyrimidines are cytosine thymine and in rna it's uracil Right? And I remember thinking that uracil is simply the uh, non-methylated version of the pyrimidine. Right, so here's the base pairing. You can see that there are two base pairs between the thymine and the adenine, and three, I'm sorry, hold on, not base pairing, three hydrogen, ah, two hydrogen bonds. There are two hydrogen bonds between the T and the A. There are three between the G and the C, okay? One quick way to remember that is when you write these out, you can kind of do this and you can do, well, let me write the, the GC one. You can draw it like this. So there's three there versus two there, okay? Three versus two. All right, there's, there are the uh, intimate details of the molecular structures of the nitrogenous bases within DNA. And here's just another figure showing you the anti-parallel nature. And now we're going to dig into the details of the bonds themselves that hold the nucleotides together. So in this course, there have been a few bonds, a few named bonds, right? There's the peptide bond that holds amino acids together. There's the glycosidic bond that holds sugars together. And here's the phosphodiester bond that holds nucleotides together, right? And so you can see here, this carbon attaches to this oxygen bound to the phosphate, right? So this is the phosphoric acid, the, phosph uh, the, the phosphate group bound to the three prime carbon. And then in turn, the phosphate group itself is bound to the five prime carbon. Okay, so actually that's the five prime carbon and that's the three prime carbon. Okay, so the phosphodiester linkage is what joins the sugar phosphate backbone. This is the bond incidentally that is built when you have DNA ligase doing the steps in between the, uh, the final step linking the two Okazaki fragments together, which we'll get to uh, later. Okay, let's talk about DNA replication now. Interestingly, when Watson and Crick first published their one page uh, uh, journal article in the Journal of Nature in 1953, they had a very little small paragraph there that said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material, right? That uh, when they were talking about there is when you have this DNA double helix, right? Separate it, watch this. If you separate it out, Okay, think about this. You have not lost any information 
right, there is just as much information on the left and the right because for every A there's a T and for every C there's a G. And so when you separate these out, each one of these is essentially a template that you can use to build a new double helix, right? You can build a brand new double stranded piece of DNA. Now this looks so intuitive and it makes so much sense. I can imagine people were a little skeptical of it being true based on the fact that DNA was the genetic material, not the proteins, because that seemed to be intuitive as well. And so there was a lot of work over the next few years, right? Pretty much after 1953, all right, over the next five years, the double-stranded uh, helix was confirmed by several people. And then once they started realizing this really was, you know, the real deal, they had to start understanding, one, how it was replicated, right? And then two, how it coded. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what we're going to talk about now, replication. So here is just a diagram showing you Watson and Crick's basic concept here. You have the parent molecule of the original double-stranded helix. You separate it out, so now you have two nucleic acids, each one serving as a template to build a brand new double helix. And you can see here, they, they should have used slightly different colors. This is like a lighter blue, you can see. The lighter blue corresponds to new material. When I say new material, these are nucleotides that have been freshly added into a grown nucleic acid, right? So this is all new stuff. This was the old stuff, right? Now, think about it this way. The original is split in half, right? So each new double helix is made half out of old stuff and half out of new stuff. And because of this, they called this concept semi-conservative DNA replication, all right? Now, there are other possibilities in theory, if you're just spitballing ideas on how DNA replication can work, you can think of some other ones, right? So let's say they're, so they're semi-conservative, right? Which makes perfect sense. However, there are other possibilities. So for example, there was something called the dispersive, dispersive model, right? And what that said was, if you had a double-stranded helix, the new one would actually be made out of a combination of the old material and the new material. That each strand was sort of kind of dispersed between old and new. Nobody postulated a working mechanism of this, but it was a possibility. Um, and then the third, so this would be the first kind, this would be the second time. And then the third kind would be a uh, fully conservative model. Conservative, in which you would start with a single double-stranded helix, and then when you would be done, you would have one of the original old stuff still fully intact, and then a new one made out of completely new material. All right? And so even though there were no detailed mechanistic possibilities mapped out, they still needed to rule these other two out, and it was not easy. There were um, people working on this, and eventually you had these uh, uh, Messelson install comes along, and figures out how to sort out between the conservative versus the semi-conservative versus the dispersive. It's a really, really clever experiment. That's what we're going to talk about now. All right, so Messelson and Stahl were able to distinguish between the three models experimentally. And their work, published in 58, so just five years later, supported the semi-conservative semi replication. All right, and this is how it worked. They basically took advantage of the fact that nitrogen-15 is much heavier than nitrogen 14. Well, I should say much heavier. It's different by a pro uh, neutron, so that's okay. They, they took advantage, though, of that difference, right? So if you purify DNA, you take a DNA purification, and you take it and you run it in a test tube that is filled with a very viscous sephirose material, um, or rather, I'm sorry, not sephirose, sucrose, all right? So this is just basically a really viscous liquid that DNA when you pipette it on here, it just kind of floats on the surface, right? But then you put this thing in an insanely powerful centrifuge, an ultra centrifuge, and you're able to spin this stuff down at something like 80,000 times the force of gravity, okay? And so what this does is it allows the DNA to penetrate through that, uh, that sucrose. 
And, you know, the heavier it is, the more gravity is going to act on it and the farther down it's going to go, right? So now you can picture a double-stranded uh, a double stranded helix of DNA from bacteria that were grown in heavy nitrogen, right? And so this DNA here is all nitrogen 15 because it, let's say they grow for a couple weeks right and so if you run a control and you take that dna out you run it in a tube let's say that the dna runs like right here all right and then contrast that with another tube so here let's just write that out sorry my handwriting or my my drawing in this is just terrible today um so let's say that it ran right here okay now grow another culture of bacteria but in light nitrogen right and you would expect it to be running say here Okay, so this gives us a really nice framework to ask simple questions about DNA replication. So Messelson and Stull, after about two years of optimizing their experiments, they figured out how, for example, bacteria would replicate exactly once in 20 minutes. Okay, and they would replicate a second time in 40 minutes when but they hit what's called log phase growth. Basically, you put some, imagine taking a, a uh, an Erlenmeyer flask here, and then uh, seeding it with a few bacteria, right? And then growing it and growing it for a couple hours. It eventually, it reaches a logarithmic or exponential growth phase where it's just replicating like crazy every 20 minutes. All right, so they, they were able to calibrate their experiments with this heavy nitrogen. And then what they did was they transferred that heavy nitrogen bacteria into light nitrogen. Okay, so they took DNA that was filled with nitrogen 15, right? And so the key here, the key uh, vision I want you to have here is that strand of DNA, that strand of DNA right here, this is made out of heavy nitrogen. And so too is this one, all right? So they're both made out of here. Let's, so let's say that red is heavy nitrogen and then let's get a different color here. Let's say uh, blue is light nitrogen, okay? And so this would be what DNA would look like if it was written in, or if it was grown, written in, if it was grown in nitrogen 14, and this is what it would look like if it was grown in nitrogen 15, okay? And so now you can think, growing it in nitrogen 14, what that means is that the building blocks that the cell would use to build new DNA, the building blocks, the, the, oops, the, um, Ah, sorry about that. The building blocks, so the um, the nit uh, nitrogenous base and phosphate. The nitrogens in the nitrogenous base here would be nitrogen 14. Okay, that's the key here. So that when the cells are transferred here, the only building blocks they have, the only thing is that available to them to build DNA with is the nitrogen 14, right? And so if you think about it, if they take the old DNA, the old DNA being <coughs> the nitrogen, oops, that's still new DNA, the old DNA, okay, so here's the old DNA, the cell's got that in it. Now the cell takes in the light nitrogen nucleotides and it, oops, and it builds it. So what would it do? Well, if it was semi-conservative, right, you would have half of the heavy nitrogen 15, and then the cell would use the light nitrogen to build the other one, right? And now think about it. If we purify all of this kind of DNA and we run that on our little sucrose gradient, right? If let's say that this is where we would expect the 14 to run, and this is where we would expect the 15 to run, we would expect this to run somewhere in between and say like the hybrid band a 14, 15 band, right? On the other hand, if conservative replication was the case, right? If conservative replication was the case, then this would stay intact, right? And so we would expect to see, after one round of replication, we would expect to see a 15 band, right? And then if, if that was intact, then the new one would have to be 100% nitrogen 14. And so we would expect to see two bands, one running at the 14 and one running at the 15. And if they did see that, that would have supported conservative replication. Okay, now the problem with dispersive replication is that it would look exactly the same as the semi-conservative, right? Because if you think of it, it would look basically like a candy cane stripe for both helices, right? Both of them would be a nice even combination of the blue 
and the red. And so like the semi-conservative model, we would see a hybrid band again, right? So after one round of replication, right? So now we can look at this figure here from the book. After the first replication, okay, we would see either, we would see the, uh, if conservative was the case, we would see two bands, which they didn't see, right? When they ran their experiment, they only saw one band. Okay, so now the question was, well, so matter of elimination, we can get rid of the conservative model. Right, but we can't eliminate the dispersive model. So then they let the DNA go another generation, another 20 minutes go by, and they take another sample out. This is what lets them detect the difference between these two. Why? Because in the semi-conservative, if semi-conservative semi is true, right? Now, after that second round of replication, oops, let me start over again. That second round of replication, we'd have, um, we'd have half, new and half old, right? And then if that replicated, again, we're staying in the light nitrogen. If this replicated, we would again split this apart, right? And so here would be that existing old one. And then building it, we would get now a completely new band of pure nitrogen 14, right? And then the other half would be, right? The old material plus half of the new material. So we would actually see if, if semi-conservative was the case after the second replication, we would expect to see, we would expect to see one band of pure 14 light and one band of a hybrid nature, right? We would expect to see two bands. However, if dispersive replication was the case, right? If dispersive replication was the case, it would just always continue to look like the hybrid band, we would still just continue to see two, uh, I'm sorry, we would still continue to see one hybrid band of the 14 and 15. And so after that second round of replication, they actually detected two bands, as you can see right here, successfully eliminating the dispersive model. Okay, so that's Messelson and Stahl. They were able to experimentally conclude that DNA replicated in a semi-conservative manner. Voila. Here's a really nice diagram I stole off the internet, and you can see this is a great summary. Okay, you have the bacteria growing in nitrogen 15. So there's the uh, growing in 15, and so take a control. Let's take a sample of this and spin it out. And sure enough, you can see the heavy band here, right? There's the heavy band. You allow it to then transfer to nitrogen 14 and you allow it to replicate exactly once right and you can see that they got a single band here there's your hybrid band <clears throat> and then after another 20 minutes 40 minutes total they were able to then see two bands all right very clearly i mean this is this is night and day when you run these experiments and so this was a really really powerful simple experiment okay so that's Messelson and Stahl. So this is a very basic overview of semi-conservative DNA replication. We're going to go through this mechanism in a bit of detail. So let's uh, do this iteratively. The first wave here will be just the basics. So the first step is the parent strands separate. All right, there's the unwinding of the double helix. And then the second thing is the um, base pairing occurs, right? So I guess uh, two would be the individual base pairing comes along. And then three is, I guess over here, that would be the fusing of the backbone. All right, so unwinding, base pairing, and then joining. That's the simplest way, very, very simple way to think about it. All right, so we're gonna dig into the details now. And the first detail is where it actually occurs. So remember, during S phase, the DNA is being synthesized in the eukaryotic cell cycle, and that produces the two sister chromatids, right? The, the two sister chromatids we're all very familiar with by now, the halves of a mitotic chromosome or duplicated chromosome. And um, so it all begins at what's called an origin of replication, or ORI. 
bacterial chromosomes, you remember, are circular. And bacterial chromosomes have a single point of origin, a single origin of replication. In contrast, eukaryotic chromosomes actually have multiple origins of replication, which is why they are capable of replicating pretty quickly, even though it is uh, thousands of times more DNA than a small little bacterial chromosome. So what's happening at that origin? The first thing that happens, the first step in DNA replication, we can call unwinding. All right, it's where the double-stranded helix basically becomes unzipped. If you imagine this as a zipper, right? If this is a, oops, if this is a zipper here, okay, I'm not in my pen tool right now. Let me get back into my pen tool. I guess we'll start, we'll do, yeah, we'll go back to red. All right. <clears throat> So if you imagine a zipper, right, here's, here's a zipper, right, all zipped together. And then think about the little doohickey that you pull on. The little, it's always got a little hole right here, right? So this is the metal thing that when you pull it up, it causes the zipper to unzip, right? And so the enzyme that behaves this way is called helicase. All right, this little piece of Swiss cheese looking uh, cartoon figure. So DNA helicase unwinds the double helix. Now, if I was to extend this picture here, you would basically see this. So there's your what's called a replication bubble. You'll see that a little bit more detail on another slide. All right, so here's, oh, here, here. Uh, here's your double stranded helix. All right, the first thing that we do is DNA helicase is going to come in and essentially imagine pulling this apart. If you pull it apart, what it's going to look like is like this. All right, now here's the thing. If you have two pieces of string that are twined like this and you actually just go in there and give these a yank, what's going to happen is upstream of the pull, the double strands are going to not more. They're going to compress. They're going to supercoil. All right, so we actually need another protein here, another enzyme called topoisomerase. I know that you might be tempted to pronounce this in a French way like topoisomerase, but it's not. It's topo as in topography, as in surface, and then iso as in, um, uh, hmm, I guess same. And then, you know, there's your ASC at the end for uh, signifying it's an enzyme. So topoisomerase is, um, I guess it, it kind of in invokes the concept of an isomer, right? Where you have uh, the same building blocks, but different shape, right? So topoisomerase is basically remodeling DNA. And the way it does it in this case is it'll snip the DNA and then it'll release that supercoiling tension so that it doesn't uh, end up busting around. Um, so there you go. <clears throat> the helicase therefore um, melts the strands and the topoisomerase just keeps everything intact upstream. Then there's one more protein here in uh, the first stage. These are called single-stranded binding proteins. All right, single-stranded DNA binding proteins or SSBs. What these do is they basically protect the single strands of DNA and in addition, hold it open sort of like a vice or, or a, uh, um, oh boy, or a clamp, uh, keeping, keeping this open so that it can be replicated. All right, so that's the first step. And here's just another picture. You can see helicase now. Helicase would be moving in this direction to rip it apart. All right, the key is, is helicase is breaking the hydrogen bonds breaking the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. All right, so at that origin of replication, you have what forms called the replication bubble. Okay, the replication bubble. On each side of the replication bubble, you can see what looks like a fork. Okay, so this... <clears throat> The, oh, I lost my marker again. I'm not sure how that happens exactly. Um, let's go back here. All right. So this, that's a replication fork. Okay. 
it's a really bad looking fork. I guess we'd need m more <laughs> more prongs there. But basically, it's a two pronged fork. All right, and there's two of these. There's the one on the left, and there's the one on the right. All right, so there's fork one. There's fork two. So <clears throat> that's what happens when the DNA is unwound. Now it's important to note that each one of these strands has now unpaired base pairs, uh, <laughs> unpaired bases. Okay, so these serve now as templates. And you can see here in prokaryotes, there's your single origin of replication, right? And so there's your single origin of replication. And you can see that when the bubble opens, you can see the new DNA being formed, and you can see that replication occurs in a bi-directional manner. It goes out from the origin in both directions. All right, and you can see that as this continues to unzip on either side and replicate, it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger until you can see um, it's almost completed, and then boom, you have two daughter molecules. All right, this electron micrograph down here, you can see, um, so here is the fork and here's the fork. All right, so, here, so here's the original DNA, all right? There's the original DNA. All right, so you can imagine here, to, to understand this picture, if it doesn't make sense to you yet, here's the original DNA, all right? And now you can imagine a little bubble forming here, okay? And then as replication continues, it'll, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what you're seeing here, right, this and this is that and that, okay? On the right, you can see the eukaryotic origins of replication. You can see that a single chromosome has multiple ones. In this case, you see there's three, right? And each one of these bubbles moves bi-directionally. And so eventually they're going, oops, they're going to meet in the middle, right? And then that would give you two daughter molecules. These are your sister chromatids. All right, you can see the electron micrograph here. Um, actually, I have a better picture on the next slide, I believe. Yeah, here we go. So this is the one you already saw. This is the prokaryotic. This is the eukaryotic. And as you can see here, here's your original DNA, and then here's your replication bubbles, right? Isn't that cool? Lots and lots of them so that in a given chromosome, the rate at which it occurs is still very rapid because there's so many of them. I, I think it's kind of interesting here <laughs> that they, they don't measure this in terms of microns or uh, uh, mi micrometers. They measure it in terms of what are called KBs or kilobases, right? Thousands of bases. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. So a typical gene is about you, uh, I, I don't want to spitball here, a couple of thousand base pairs. So that's that's one gene right there. And so you can see the relative portion here of uh, how big a gene is relative to what you're seeing. All right, here we go. Step two, we can call priming, right? So what does that mean? So replication proceeds outward from the forks in both directions, as we said, but before we can begin, before we can start making new DNA, we have to prime the strands for DNA polymerase. All right, so, so DNA polymerase, that's the name of the enzyme that's going to build the new nucleic acid. DNA polymerase is unable to begin its job with a single strand of DNA. It can't just start making something from scratch or de novo, as they say. Instead, it can only add to an existing three prime end. What's that mean? So imagine that this is a strand of DNA, okay? DNA polymerase can't just come in here and just start laying tracks like this. Oh no, if only, if only, it would be so simple then. But no, that's not what happens. Here's your original template, all right? The first thing that actually has to happen is we have to put a primer down. So you can imagine, here I'll go to the other color, I'll use purple this time, right? So let's just build, we're gonna put a new nucleotide here and then another one here and another one here and another one here. There, okay, so let's just stop there. So that purple part we can call the primer, okay? And that would be the three prime end of the growing chain. So now DNA polymerase can come in, which is this big complicated enzyme that has kind of a clamp domain over here. 
and then a catalytic domain so that it's grabbing on here and now it's going to just take these nucleotides which are floating around everywhere and by the way that's not the letter T that's just uh, how I like to cartoon in nucleotides right and so each one of these T's if we zoom in this is a five prime or a three prime so those those are the ends right so let's just say hypothetically this is five prime and this is three prime and then this would be the base so like that would be a okay so so that's why it looks kind of like a t so the idea is these are free nucleotides and dna polymerase is going to bring these in and link them together here like this so the, the dna polymerase will itself move in this direction by adding template uh, by adding to the growing strand in that direction all right so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on how we make that purple thing that primer and so what happens is this so let's just take this this uh this replication fork okay and let's take this little region of dna and just zoom in there and get an idea of what we're doing in detail here all right so the key concept we, we're talking about here is that dna polymerase can't synthesize dna without an existing three prime end so where do we get it so primase comes in that's the name of the enzyme primase adds new nucleotides from scratch it's capable of de novo synthesis now notice that these nucleotides are red instead of the last slide where they were blue that's because unlike unlike these nucleotides which are made out of deoxyribonucleotides these are just plain old ribonucleotides yes this is rna okay so primase adds an rna primer to the original template strand now we have what we need we have that three prime phosphate group here rather the three uh, the three prime carbons here but this is the three prime end of the growing strand now dna polymerase can come in and do its job right that's what we're looking for here And so here we are, this green blobby thing, that's the enzyme DNA polymerase, and you can see the Roman numeral here, three. All right, we're going to be focusing on the prokaryotic replication process because a lot more is known about that. And so in prokaryotic replication, particularly in E. coli, Escherichia coli, the DNA polymerase that extends on the primer is called DNA polymerase three. All right, we're going to learn about DNA polymerase 3. There's going to be DNA polymerase 1. Those are the two major ones in replication. And then the other ones that are missing, 2, 4, and 5, are the ones, we're not going to really go into details, but they're basically involved in repairing DNA when it gets damaged. Okay? So DNA polymerase is now able to synthesize new strands of nucleic acid using deoxyribonucleotides right you see the dntps so they're blue now so now we have this kind of uh, uh frankenstein nucleic acid that's kind of half rna and half dna yes that's going to be a problem we're going to have to deal with later all right <clears throat> so now in a perfect world dna wouldn't be anti-parallel right this is the other problem here so remember the original strand here right is three prime and five prime so the new strand, because of anti-parallel DNA, right, this is the three prime end and this is the five prime end. All right, so that leads to a very interesting problem in replication, especially at the fork. So watch this, we're gonna go back to the fork now. So here we are, we have this direction of synthesis, right? The overall bubble, if we go back to the picture of a bubble of replication, right, the fork, is moving this way and what, what do we mean by moving this way if you watched a movie of this from a bird's eye view and you can see the individual enzymes you'd actually see the bubble get well, here you, you'd see this so here's your bubble all right then you would see sorry let's try that again there's the bubble let's just focus on that fork on the left here so and here let's make it really long that's the problem all right, so over time, you're going to see it grow. See that? And then, of course, as it grows, we're going to see... Uh, I don't want to talk to you right now, Cortana. We're going to see the DNA get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So the, the, the overall, the replication fork's going that way. 
Now, here's the key. There is a really big complex called the DNA polymerase hollow enzyme. All right, and the DNA polymerase hollow enzyme moves overall in this direction. Now, because this strand here is growing in the same direction that the fork is growing, the same direction, we call this the leading strand. And its story is a simple one, and we've just finished it. The problem's going to be this guy. So the way this works is, even though the overall hollow enzyme is going that way, this strand has to be synthesized this way. So that leads to problems. Basically what happens is this. The strand begins to be synthesized, okay, but because the hollow enzyme is going this way, we now have to go like this. You see that? So let's see if I can cartoon this out. Here's the lagging strand. There's a leading strand. All right, so we're going to go this way. So imagine uh, imagine this circle here is the whole enzyme, hollow enzyme, right? And so there's lots of moving parts in there. Then over time, it's going to move this way, right? And so let's say it's here now, all right? And there's the new DNA coming out of it. There's the old DNA going into it. All right, so this strand here, this strand here, that's the easy one. Okay, so this strand here is basically having to do this. Okay, that's the best I can show you with uh, my limited little doodles. But the key is there's individual, individual fragments. Okay, individual fragments. These individual fragments are called Okazaki fragments. Well, let me just... Uh, yeah, there we go. So the synthesis of the lagging strand, it has to be continually restarted over and over again. What what the uh, the book will call this is discontinuous, discontinuous DNA replication. All right, and so each one of these fragments is called an Okazaki fragment, named after uh, Ryu Okazaki, the Japanese researcher who discovered them. <clears throat> and so for Okazaki fragments, you have the um, so so you have primase come in and lay the primer, then you have DNA polymerase come in and extend the chain a little bit, all right, and then you have and here's the key, a new enzyme DNA polymerase. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. DNA polymerase three is the one that comes in and does its normal replication. Then DNA polymerase one comes in, okay, and it removes the primer removes the primer and then after it removes the primer it replaces what was missing with DNTPs right deoxynucleotide triphosphates um, the, the building blocks that are made of DNA not RNA and then lastly these have to be joined together covalently that phosphodiester bond we talked about earlier on and so there's a last enzyme here called DNA ligase and ligase basically glues them together. All right, the word ligate is uh, it's just a plain old English word that means to basically glue things together. All right. And incidentally, uh, I, what I didn't mention before about the leading strand was yes, the the primer also has to be removed and then the uh, and then backfilled, which is all again DNA polymerase one, and then ligase sticks uh, the covalent bond, the phosphos phosphodiester linkage between the big long strand and that tiny little bit of backfilled primer. Okay. So, no, so I just said all this, uh, I just doodled all this out, but here's a summary again. So once the DNA fragments, the Okazaki fragments are created, DNA polymerase one comes in and removes those RNA primers and then replaces it with DNA nucleotides. And then another enzyme comes in, DNA ligase, which fuses the sugar phosphate backbone together. Okay, so here's a really nice, simple summary view of what a replication bubble looks like, adding onto it the information of how the DNA is replicated on each side. All right, so here's another vision you can have. Go down this way, okay, cut it in half. You can see 
the fork on the left and the fork on the right. And the fork on the left, I want you to tell me what is this end? Is this the three prime or the five prime? All right, I want you to sit there and just chew on that for a bit and give me an answer. And so basically fill in, here we go, fill in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. All right, label each one of those, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Label them either three or five, okay? You can do it, ready, go. Or I'll tell you what, pause it. <laughs> pause it and work on your own. Um, and so I'll give you a little moment here. Okay, so here we go. This is how you do it. This is continuous, right? Because that's continuous, because that's continuous, we're going to assume that this, therefore, has to be in the five prime to three prime direction, right? Because that's the only way we can grow mm -hmm. DNA continuously. So if that's the three prime end, then A has to be five prime, right? If this is just a little matrix here of if it's three or five prime, right? So A is five prime, and then therefore C is three prime, all right? And then we already announced that E is three prime, there's three prime. All right, so now G, because that's five to three, right? G has to be five, and then H has to be three. And then who did I miss here? B, where's B? All right, so if A is five, then B has to be three, and D has to be five, okay? And then where's F? F has to be, that has to be five prime. All right, so there you have it. The key, the key here, now really, there's a really even easier way to do that. You know that DNA has to be grown from the five prime to the three prime. And so if you see an arrowhead, that's gotta be three, right? Anytime you see an arrowhead, that's the simplest way to, that's a three. All right, and if this is three, then this over here has to be five. All right, good. So, uh, so here's um, here's my attempt to visualize the Okazaki fragments. You can see here, um, and I'll play this over and over again. So on the left here, let's just focus on the left. Just focus on this one right now. That's the hollow enzyme. Oops, that's the hollow enzyme moving in towards the left. Okay. Uh, on the right, you can see. So this is going to be the leading strand. This is going to be the lagging strand. Okay. Sorry about that. So here we go. So the replication is gonna move in this direction. And as it does, you'll see this one also moving in this direction. Sorry, let's say that again. You'll see number one also moving in that direction. Oh boy. Oh, I have to go back. Huh. Okay, here we go again. Uh, sorry about that. So here's the hollow enzyme. Here's DNA polymerase three going in this direction. And sure enough, it's moving in tandem with the entire um, hollow enzyme. In contrast, notice two. It's going in the opposite direction. Opposite direction of replication. Or rather, opposite direction of the, the replication fork. And so because of that, you can see the next, if I kept animating this, this would happen, right? And then in the next uh, little diagram or action, one would keep going this way, right? but then a new two would have to come in and go this way again, right? So we just keep doing that over and over and over again. And so each movement here, that would be an Okazaki fragment, right? And then there'd be another Okazaki fragment, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now here is um, where we left off last time. Here is the RNA primer. Here is the DNA that's been extended. And so the first thing that happens is DNA polymerase one comes in, rips out the primer and builds in new nucleotides. Let's see that again, that was a little kind of fast here. So there, here comes DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase one, and then it builds the new strand, all right? And then it leaves, and then ligase comes in and builds that new phosphodiester bond, okay? So let's watch that again. So 
here is the it's leading or le this could be the end of an okazaki fragment or rather the beginning of an okazaki fragment or this could be the beginning of the leading strand in any case we have this rna dna hybrid so dna polymerase one comes in and removes those rnas and replaces them with dna okay and then when it leaves in order to fuse the old and the new ligase comes in and glues them together so that's that all right now this slide gives you a really nice overview of the process we just covered and it pays careful attention to the names of the enzymes that i want you to understand okay so you can use this for your studying and here's a summary of the the concepts i would say the most difficult concepts to really wrap people's heads around is uh is lagging strand synthesis and so one really easy way to do this one straightforward way to remember the overall process is to think of it like an assembly line where you have uh, the order of the enzymes so just know the key players know what they do um, know the difference between DNA polymerase 1 and 3 <clears throat> understand the RNA primers and why we have to pull them out understand what continuous and discontinuous replication is I um, obviously you know what Okazaki fragments are. Okay, so there's that. Now, one of the uh, uh, other things to think about is the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes when it comes to this. So, as I said earlier, prokaryotic replication is uh, much more simple, and it's much more easily understood. We know more about it. We know less about eukaryotic DNA replication, although, to be fair, we know quite a bit about both of these things. Um, and if you ever take you know, molecular biology or molecular genetics, you'll, um, you'll dig into the real, real, you know, get into the, the cells on the leaves of the forest, so to speak. Um, well, so one big take home though, eukaryotic replication includes way more DNA polymerases. Um, and it's not that these are doing the actual replication. Most of these uh, are involved in specific kinds of DNA repair that we'll talk a bit about later. Um, and so at the current count, there's, there's 16 and growing, the number of DNA polymerases we know about. And instead of uh, Roman numerals, like in prokaryotes, we label DNA polymerases with uh, Greek notation, right? So sigmas and lambdas and all that. The other thing is DNA replication in eukaryotes is slower. Um, and this is compensated for by having many, many origins on a given chromosome. And it's you know if you do something slower you do it more carefully so it's also far more accurate and this makes sense because if you remember a single human goes from one cell to 32 trillion cells and so it makes sense that we're going to need to have a very high fidelity rate fidelity rate meaning the rate at which uh, DNA is well, I should say error rate, really. Fidelity is the, the accuracy of it. The error rate would be um, you know, how, how likely it is to make an error. All right, so here are the key players in prokaryotic replication. This is another summary slide for your studying. You can uh, so, so know all these enzymes here, and this is good for helping you know where it happens, or what their roles are. Right, so going back to the fidelity of replication, uh, in general, DNA polymerase itself, so just with nothing else added, will make a mistake in about one in every 100,000 bases. Really, oops, that's a, that should be a five. This is one in a million. So it's one in about, uh, so one times 10 to the fifth mistakes um, uh, per, per thousand, wrong boy. One mistake per 100,000 bases. All right, now, uh, one of the most common errors that is made is that during replication, the polymerase accidentally puts a uh, different, so if this is an A, um, and it's supposed to be a T, right? But if a C accidentally comes in there, then what happens is the DNA polymerase will uh, have the wherewithal to remove that right away. So it's able to make error corrections itself. Now that said, some mistakes are actually missed. And then after replication, they're caught by other enzymes involved, right? So that's called, uh, the one example of that is called DNA mismatch repair. Okay, so in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the, uh, the range at which they get it wrong is anywhere from, uh, but now this is, this is after we account for error correction. 
Okay, so once we talk about DNA replication uh, errors being corrected, the fidelity rate or the error rate goes up to 1 times 10 to the 8th or 1 times 10 to the 10th. That's up to 10 billion. Um, so, so that's one error in every 10 billion. Okay, which is just, a, that's a crazy, crazy low number. Um, and so your book is pretty decisive about that one in 10 billion number. The thing is, is we don't really know. Okay, this is a, a very active, a very hot research area in terms of how much uh, errors, how, how many errors are made during a round of replication. So right now, we'll just say it's about one in a billion for everybody and leave it at that. So, um, yeah, so why is it so accurate? There's basically, there's three mechanisms for this accuracy. The first is, is the, the innate, intrinsic uh, structures of everything, the hydrogen bonding between the complementary pairs. So if you think about the way um, adenine is structured, so here, let's just make a kind of a slightly more detailed view of, oops, uh, of adenine than we're, we're usually <coughs> making these days. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so let's just pretend here. There's so there's two hydrogen bonds to then to uh, uh, thymine, which has this basic structure. All right, so you can picture there's two hydrogen bonds there. Okay, in contrast to thymine. Okay, you can imagine therefore if adenine had a uh, a neighbor that was say I don't know so cytosine uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Cytosine. Let's do cytosine. So cytosine has a slightly different structure than uh, thymine, and it doesn't have the ability to form the hydrogen bonds with it. Okay. And so as a result of that, if you're sitting there in the groove of DNA and there's an A, if a C comes in or a G comes in or, you know, even a uracil somehow. Um, no, actually, that doesn't, that can't even happen. Uh, so let's just... <laughs> Sorry, let's say that again. So let's say a C or a G comes in. Because T is the one that's going to stick really well, then the C and the G just kind of, you know, meander along and don't get incorporated into it uh, commonly. So hydrogen bonding, that's the first major mechanism for accuracy. The second is that the um, uh, DNA polymerase itself won't form bonds if the pairs mismatch. So if you, you can imagine, let's say that uh, there's there's the, you know again there's a and then here's the the new the, the, there's a free three prime end so if DNA polymerase is here you can imagine the active site within the enzyme okay so let's say this is the enzyme and that's the active site you can imagine the shape of the interior of this active site being such that it doesn't favor uh, say two purines or two pyr pyrimidines being bound together um, and so it'll be less likely to mismatch in that way simply because the shape doesn't work right. All right. And then lastly, as I said earlier, DNA polymerase can proofread. All right. So hydrogen bonding, the actual shape of the polymerase active sites, and then the fact that DNA polymerase can proofread its uh, uh, final work. Okay. So, so speaking of proofreading, right, I just said that. Proofreading occurs throughout the replication process and most polymerases are capable of sensing these mismatches and making the corrections. Um, however, once mistakes are made and integrated into the DNA, and we can call that a lesion, okay, there's a, maybe a new word for you, a lesion of DNA is a, uh, a mismatch, a, a mistake in the process, or rather a mistake in the double helix. It's not a mutation yet because it hasn't been passed on. All right, so once there's a lesion in DNA, there's this armada of replication enzymes. There's DNA polymerases, there's nucleases, there's all sorts of these enzymes involved in repairing the DNA. And so on the right here, you can see there's our, our friend DNA polymerase three, the major one. There's one, okay, and the nice little functional summaries here. That's good. But then here we go, two, four, and five are involved the in different kinds of DNA repair. Okay, <clears throat> and then in the human ones, there's, you know, alpha, delta, epsilon, gamma, eta, kappa, iota, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to know the details here for any tests or quizzes I'll be giving you. Um, but if you're one of those people that likes a little attention to detail, feel free to study this a bit. Um, and you can basically see here that DNA, polymerase, alpha, beta, uh, 
let's see. So, so really what's important here is the fact that you can map some of these to, uh, but not all of them. I'm just making a quick glance here. Yeah, okay. So some of these, so, so alpha, DNA polymerase alpha, DNA polymerase epsilon um, have their abilities, intrinsic abilities of uh, uh, editing the DNA when they make mistakes. Whereas there's plenty of others that are being discovered that have very specific functions. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, damage can occur, as I said, during replication, or it can happen after the fact. Okay. So, for example, if you're hanging out in the sun and you're being exposed to UV radiations, there's a very common uh, uh, mistake that happens in the DNA called a thymine dimer. Right, so there's there's some stretch of DNA, and here's another stretch. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Let's say that these are two A's, all right, for you know whatever reason, blah blah blah, A A blah blah blah. So there's two T's here. Now those two T's, when they're exposed to high levels of UV radiation, will actually form a covalent linkage between them, okay, like this. They'll actually be covalently bonded. And so what that does is it causes a pinch in the DNA, or rather a bulge in the DNA. You can see it up here. Okay, a bump, like a, like a pothole, the opposite of a pothole. And so there are enzymes that can sense this topography on the DNA. You can picture these enzymes roaming around, constantly bumping into DNA and reading it, almost like reading Braille, and seeing this bump and then calling into action the other enzymes that are gonna come and repair it, all right? So one of the key enzymes in repairs is called nuclease, all right? So really, this is a family of proteins. You guys have learned about kinases. You've learned about phosphatases. You've learned about these different families of enzymes that do specific tasks. So now you're gonna learn about the nucleases, okay? A nuclease is an enzyme that can break that phosphodiester bond. And there's basically, there's two kinds of nucleases, okay? If you have a stretch of DNA here, nucleases that are capable of attacking a strand in the middle as opposed to at the end, okay? So the ones that attack the middle, like the ones that are gonna be involved in damage, are called endonucleases. All right, now you've, you know, those, it's the exo and endos. You guys remember this from exocytosis and endocytosis, okay? And there's the other uses for these, um, endogenous and exogenous. So we have um, endonucleases and we have exonucleases, okay? So exonucleases you can think of are like Pac-Man. They gobble up the ends and then they slowly break apart the uh, these are supposed to be, this is a really bad cartoon, these are supposed to be nucleotides flying off as they get chomped up. So they're getting shredded here and they're being knocked off. That's the exonuclease. The endonuclease is going to be able to cut the DNA in the middle. All right, and that's useful when you have some kind of damage. Basically, cut out a big chunk. <clears throat> okay, so nuclease cuts the chunk out. And then a DNA polymerase comes in. Okay, so for example, DNA polymerase 1 might do this for some things. DNA polymerase 2 might do it for other things. And what it does is it backfills that hole with fresh nucleotides, correctly pairing it to whatever was left. And then our friend DNA ligase comes in and fuses that phosphate, uh, the sugar phosphate backbone together. Okay, now, so, so this is a lesion and this is a repaired lesion. Now let's say that in the process of, the, of this repair, for some reason, instead of it, so let's say this used to be T, T, and A, A, okay? And let's say that uh, for whatever reason, this became G, G, and C, C, okay? And then this gets inherited in the next cell as the cell goes through mitosis. Now it's a mutation, okay? So by definition, mutations are heritable changes to the DNA sequence, all right? All right, so other kinds of damage, and I don't expect you to know the details here. Just understand that there's many kinds of DNA damage, and there's many kinds of repair mechanisms in place for those damages, okay? So for example, there's radiation damage like we just talked about, and so the repair of a uh, thymine dimer is an example of what's called nucleotide 
excision repair. We're cutting it out. We're excising it. All right. There's also mismatch repair. This is when you have the A and the C or the G, and that's a mismatch, right? And so that's, kind of, that's another kind of correction. So in summary, the enzymes involved in repairing include nucleases and polymerases and DNA ligase, all right? <clears throat> and just now think about this, right? Well, 100 enzymes of nucleases, why are there so many of these, 170 in humans? Well, think about it. The most important molecule on the planet is DNA. Okay, DNA gets to sit in the nucleus and do nothing. It just lounges there. It just stores information and is constantly being damaged by its environment or being mistakes being made during replication. And if the cell isn't aware of this damage and not making the corrections involved, then what's going to happen is over time, a series of lesions become mutations. Those accumulate and those mutations end up occurring slowly into really important genes. And you can think of this as the road to cancer. Okay, And so you can imagine the most important thing a cell does is maintain its genome. All right, So you can think of it as geno genomic surveillance. That's like the most important job of the cell. Okay, now, uh, so what do we mean by evolutionary role? So DNA proofing and repair. <clears throat> uh, so basically, we do need a mistake every once in a while, right? This is, you can think of, the forge for evolution or the furnace of evolution. The most important <laughs> mistake that's ever made is the mutation that gets passed on. Right, Because the only way we can have new genes, the way we can have new regulatory machineries, the, the way of uh, having different body structures and different, um, you know, d different, basically different adaptations to the environment, most of all of that comes from changing the genes. All right? And the only way you can do that is having a mutation occur in the gametes. Right, think about that. The only cells that go to the next generation are the eggs and the sperm, right? The gametes. Or if you're a fungus, the spore. Or if you're, you know, a plant, it could be the sporophytes. <clears throat> so these are the cells that if mutations occur in them, they're the ones that get passed on. Okay. So um, the kinds of mutations that we'll talk about now are there's basically three kinds of mutations. There's mutations that do nothing. There's mutations that are bad, and there's mutations that are good. All right, you can imagine which one is the most common. Okay, that would probably be this one. And the most plentiful, I'm sorry, yeah, the most common would be the ones that really have no effect. Right, and then the second most common would be the ones that do damage. And then finally, a very, very small percentage of mutations are actually beneficial. All right. That's mutation in a nutshell. We'll we'll uh, we'll revisit mutations um, in a later lecture, and um, <clears throat> talk about the different kinds. And it gets very interesting. All right, now we're going to talk about telomeres. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes, right? There is a very unique problem with the ends of chromosomes. The fact is, is that when you finally get to the end. Right after uh, getting all the way here with the leading strand, that's fine. The leading strand is always fine. It's the lagging strand that has a problem, right? Because if you think about it, you always have to have new primers. And so when you get to the end, right, you put that primer down, but then there's no new place to put a primer. And so what we end up with is what's called a sticky end, right? There's, there's no way that we can keep going. And so as a result, over periods of time, the chromosomes get shorter at the ends. All right. So a telomere is basically a repeating nucleotide sequence at the end of a chromosome. So in this case, for, for humans, that repeat is TTA, GGG. Okay. So you can see here, uh, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGT. You can see here, there are one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then, oops, hold on. I didn't do that right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, no, I did. 
there's four, there's four of them here, and then there's a little bit of a, a bit left here where it's just done. Okay, so this is like half of half of a repeat. So you can see here, this cell has its telomeres fully intact, but then each subsequent generation loses a little bit of sequencing at the end. Okay, you can think of these as like a fuse. It gets shorter and shorter. So shorter telomeres are also a symptom of aging. For example, the first cloned animal in the world was a sheep, Dolly the sheep. And the way they did that, okay, this is why she was born with shortened telomeres, was so they took an egg cell from a sheep, all right, and the egg has, a, you know, a one end nucleus like normal. They enucleated it. They removed the nucleus. So now we have an egg cell that has no nucleus, okay? We take a somatic cell, so say a skin cell that has a nucleus in it, and that's a two end nucleus. They take this nucleus and they put it in the egg. So now you have a 2N egg, which would be the same content as a fertilized egg or a zygote. Then it's coaxed to divide. And so you have embryogenesis and eventually you have Dolly. All right, so the key here is this somatic cell was from the skin of an adult animal and because it was an adult, it would have had a few years to shorten as DNA replication occurred, right? And so we have a baby born, a baby sheep, a lamb born with long telomeres. And it turned out she died young. And the reason she died young was she basically died of, of, of aging. She died of old age at a young age, all right? So yeah, it's kind of one of those interesting paradoxes so that's Dolly, and that's telomeres and aging. If you want to read more about her, her death, you can read about it by clicking on this link. So there is an enzyme named telomerase that is actually able to grow or extend telomeres. All right, and the way it does that is basically it comes with its own RNA template as a guide, which it can then um, use to extend it. So here's the telomere, you can see here's the little, the three prime overhang, the sticky end, there's telomerase binding to it. And you can see here that it's binding and it's adding, you know, it's, it's base pairing here. There's that TTG, but then it adds, or rather it has a template for the rest of that repeat. Remember the repeat. And so the uh, DNA polymerase can now come in and, oh, there's a free three prime end and here's a template. And so it fills this in right here. And there's, you can see there's a fill-in and then telomerase leaves. And so you can see it's missing here, All right? Now the key is there, you have this, this five prime end over here that you need. Now we can't grow it that way, so what do we do? Well, it's like uh, an Okazaki fragment. We prime over here and then we grow it that way, right? And so there's the primer, there's the DNA, and then voila, we have now successfully extended the telomere by one repeat. All right, now it's, it's hard to see it on this diagram, but if you moved this one over a bit this way, right? I don't know, whoever designed this should have probably written this over here and moved this this way so that all the ends line up. Anyway, um, you can see that this is what's being extended here, right? That's, that's the key. So like these three TTGs, that's these TTGs. And so you can see we're extending this whole thing that way and we're growing this a little bit this way. So basically we're replicating this. So of course at the end of it, it's still a sticky end, right? We didn't, we're not filling this in. We're just extending this whole thing really. Um, we're extending this whole thing by another one. So we're adding another one of those. So you say times two or plus one, whatever. Um, the key is, is <laughs> telomerase is extending this by one repeat. And the role of telomerase during normal development is so that when the embryo is developed fully into whatever the multicellular organism is, that every cell in that body starts with a full length chromosome, okay? So telomerase is active 
and then it is shut off. Okay, and after it's shut off, um, the reason why it's shut off is so that cells, as they divide and divide and divide and divide, over time, inevitably, they will accumulate errors. And so it makes sense that at some point, after so many generations, usually it's about 20 generations, at least for some fibroblasts, um, after about 20 generations, the cells no longer divide. They go into this permanent cell cycle arrest called senescence. Okay, so senescence is uh, permanent arrest. So the cell is given mitogens, it's told grow, 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 but it doesn't. Okay, and so they believe that this is a, a protective role where the cells, if they kept growing, would eventually lead to carcinogenesis. All right, so, so that's that. Um, interestingly, all human cancers have very high levels of telomerase. And actually, uh, the, the, the book isn't really... Uh, now, I'm, I'm going from some older knowledge of my own now, but based on my own stuff from years ago, the idea was is that 50% of all cancers eventually have a mutation in the telomerase gene. They actually activate it. So it's a, it's a gain of function mutation. And then for the other 50% of cancers that don't have telomerase active, they have what's called the ALT mechanism of telomerase. It stands for alternative lengthening of telomeres, right? And one of the ways that cells can do that is if this is a chromosome, let's say this is a mitotic chromosome, and there's your telomere. So what cancer cells are capable of doing is taking two different chromosomes and actually gluing their heads together so that you get what's called a chromosome bridge, right? That's one way to get rid of the end is just mush them together, right? And so actually, if you look at cancer cells, they have all sorts of very weird looking alien chromosomes, right? Okay. Oh, by the way, so here, just a, here's a, a video I found of a good explanation for telomerase. You can click on that one. All right, so we've talked about replication, we've talked about mutation, we've talked about telomeres. Now let's talk about how DNA is packaged. Okay, we already hit this a little bit when we talked about cell cycle. All right, if you remember at the beginning of those lectures, we talked about the basic packaging of DNA. Now we're really going to get in. We're going to talk about the details. Um, so first thing to keep in mind is that your DNA is about two meters long or about six feet in length. Uh, and remember that diameter from the a couple slides ago is two nanometers, right? And so we have this huge piece of very thin string bundled up into that nucleus that is about on average about 10 microns in diameter. Right? So that's a crazy amount of compaction. And we still, this is one of the cutting edge uh, regions of molecular biology right now is understanding how DNA is packaged, how genes are turned on and off from that packaging. It's very, very interesting stuff. All right, so we're gonna learn about some of the different levels of packaging. And um, I actually looked at some of the current literature to see where we are right now. So, oh, whoa, there's a horrible typo. Chromosomes, that should be chromosomes. Um, anyway, we're, we're gonna learn about some things that the book doesn't talk about, like fractal globules. So it's really cool stuff. Wait till we get to it. All right, so the first level beyond the double-stranded helix is called the nucleosome. All right, the nucleosome is a collection of eight proteins called histones. And that collection, this heterooctomer, forms basically what looks kind of like a little pearl. Um, and you can think of these as beads on a string. All right, now the, the basic breakdown of a single nucleosome, and so that's a nucleosome, and you can see there's many of them. The, the basic breakdown you can see in the upper right here, there's basically um, eight proteins. There are two H2Bs, two H2As, two H3s, and two H4s. And then as the DNA wraps around here, precisely twice in a, another, I think it's like 2.4 or 1.6, 1, 1. I can't remember the details. But uh, after those wraps, um, the DNA is then basically clamped like this by what we call the linker histone, H1. Okay, so that's, that's the basics of histones. The other thing I want to note here, notice that there are these little 
uh, extensions coming out from the histone uh, from the nucleosome. These are the histone tails. All right. So the cartoony version of a histone isn't a, a, a ball. The cartoony version is a ball with a tail. All right. These tails <clears throat> are actually rich in the amino acid histidine. All right. Hence the name histone. And histidine is one of the 20 amino acids, and it happens to be uh, basic. So it will have positive charges in an aqueous solution. Now, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, right, the A for acid, that sugar phosphate backbone is very acidic, and so DNA has a net negative charge, right? Why? Well, remember, acids are things that donate protons to solutions, right? And so if you're leaving or if you're moving a proton away, what's left is negatively charged, right? <clears throat> and so the positively charged histone tail interacts very nicely with the negatively charged DNA. And in fact, if you put histones and DNA together in water, they spontaneously form these structures, these nucleosomes, right? How cool is that? So overall, the diameter, oops, the diameter between this is about 11 nanometers. Okay. All right. So this is the, uh, the what it actually looks like based on uh, modern X-ray crystallography, and you can see um, it doesn't look like much from uh, from here until you kind of piece it together. You can see there's the DNA, right? You can see the double helix wrapped around. Um, so this this side would be a uh, kind of a maybe a top-down view of it <clears throat> where you're looking through the if you go back here your your eye would be like here looking through it that way right so that would be the center point right here looking there and then rotate it and then this would be a side view all right which is really what you're seeing so this is this okay so this is the linker histone and the, oops, let me get rid of the annotations here. All right. So this is the linker histone <clears throat> and then you can see the DNA here and here. You can see the DNA here and here. And then the different colors denote the different histones. So blue versus the pink. You can even see the tail. Here's, here's a histone tail interacting with the DNA, right? Isn't that cool? All right, so here's an electron micrograph of the nucleosome structure. You can see they really do look like beads on a string, a little pearl necklace. <coughs> All right, so the next level up, level two, which is modeled here, is called the solenoid, or the 11 nanometer fiber. All right, so <coughs> the, um, the solenoid, which is still, I want to say it's still speculative in terms of which way it wraps, right? So you can see here, there's basically two models. There's this model and there's this model. I'm never going to ask you questions on this stuff, but it's just interesting to think about. We still don't really know even the most basic fundamental structures of DNA. We're still talking about it. But the basic idea is it's the interaction between the tails and the other histones in these higher order structures. You can think of this as maybe the quaternary structure or really the, so the, the fifth order. Um, if, if this yellow barrel here is the quaternary structure of the nucleosome, then we can think of the uh, higher order structures really as the, the fifth level, um, which I've never really thought about before, but that's really, that's really what this is. And so here it is, the, the, what we call the 30 nanometer fiber. Okay, it's um, basically it's a 3D zigzag of nucleosomes. And um, <coughs> it, uh, it's, it, what does it do? It further compacts the DNA. So if you take the beads on a string and then you tuck them away into the solenoid, it goes, uh, its compaction is about seven fold more dense. Okay, and so this here is 30 nanometers. That's why we usually call it the 30 nanometer fiber. Okay, now the next level beyond that is called, uh, it, this is where things start to get a little funky. Some, most, so your book calls it looped domains, I believe. Um, and what this basically is, <clears throat> these looped domains are scaffolds 
uh, rather they're scaffolded onto something called the nuclear matrix. This is something you're not going to read about in in any undergrad topic that I can think of. Um, this was something that I dealt with a lot when I was in grad school. Um, the nuclear matrix is still a very debatable uh, thing um, in terms of is it actually a filament network or are the filaments an artifact of the way we do experiments. It's, it's a really, really debatable topic. Um, but what, the one thing we can say is that the space in between chromosomes, okay? So if this is the nucleus, and let's say that here's a chromosome, all right, here's a chromosome, there's that space in between chromosomes. So you can think of these as like the canals of Venice, where there are just these twisted, convoluted channels in between the chromosomes. And these channels are filled with ribonuclear proteins, um, lots and lots of stuff. And so the chromosomes themselves are scaffolded onto these ribonuclear proteins, which we call the nuclear matrix. And in addition, the surface of the nucleus, so this is a nuclear membrane, just underneath the membrane. Here, I'll tell you what, let's draw the membrane like this. All right, so there's a nuclear pore, and remember there's the nuclear pore complex in there, and this is a, a basically a, a checkpoint or hole that allows things to, you know, come in and out, as it were. And just underneath the, the phospholipid bilayer, the inner membrane, there is this filamentous network called the nuclear lamina. It's made out of intermediate proteins called lamins, and this is upon which the chromosomes are scaffolded, okay? So that's the, so there's the nuclear matrix, which is basically like the lamina, but inside, and then there's the lamina. And so each chromosome itself is actually located in its own unique territory called chromatin territories. Now, this is actually a picture that I took in grad school. This was one of the more... Um, stunning things that I worked on. Stunning because it was very unexpected. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of what this is, but basically we were overexpressing a certain protein involved in leukemia um, and a very specific kind of the protein. And when we overexpress it in cancer cells, we got this every once in a while. Um, and so you can imagine if you were able to like roll this in 3D, you can almost see it's like a spider web, right? And so you can kind of see these big holes these big gaps, and I always thought of these as where within them, that's where the chromosomes were. So these were kind of, uh, this is one way to like look, visualize chromatin territories, which is pretty cool. All right, the next level up is the chromatin domain, sometimes called the TAD or topologically associated domain. Re really what this is, is if you just take one chromosome, right? So just imagine this squiggle here. All right, there's, we're just going to one continuous long chain of DNA. And you can see that as you do this, okay, as you just mentally trace that, you can see that there are some regions of the chromosome that tend to interact with each other more than, say, other chromosomes. And you can kind of draw boundaries around these highly interactive areas. That's what, what we mean by topologically associating, that the DNA is associating with itself in these regions more than DNA outside of it. And so you can kind of come up with this 3D map um, of these domains where we are isolating individual chromosomes. Okay, now this level of DNA and beyond is really, this is where the debate and the research is going in. Like we know that there's solenoids. We, we know that there's a 30 nanometer fiber. <clears throat> we know that chromosomes occupy a, f a specific domain in space. In fact, here, let me show you a picture of that. Let me skip ahead here. So chromat chromosome territories, you can see this is a nucleus and each color is associated with an entire chromosome. All right, and so you can see that chromosomes themselves occupy a defined space within the nucleus. And we don't really have a full understanding of all of this yet. Um, so there's a couple, of, there's a, this slide in the middle here. This is just showing um, how different the, uh, uh, the extended chromatin is. So you can see all these, uh, these ribbons, these filaments, almost like a web. This is all loose chromosomes. Uh, rather loose chromatin, and this is really tight bundled chromatin. 
Okay, so um, this is a slide from one of these uh, recent papers that I pulled out, and you can read about it more in detail here. You can also just skip this information and go to the next slide if you want. Okay, so we got chromatin territories, and then here we go. This is what I wanted to get at, the fractal globule. This is the nucleus, as we understand it. It is basically um, a 3D ball of bundled up chromosomes, where each chromosome takes up its own specific uh, space, that chromatin territory. All right, but <clears throat> uh, the fractal glo globule is basically the, the final level of higher order structure. What do we mean by a fractal globule? A fractal is basically a repeating math construct where the parts of it have the same shape as the overall whole. The most fam famous fractal is called the Mandelbrot fractal. Um, man, I think it's Mandelbrot. I think that's how you spell it. Um, if you want to Google that, you, you might have seen this on some you know psychedelic T-shirt or some uh, some poster. But <clears throat> the basic idea is that DNA is actually fractal in nature and this came out in uh i think was a 2000 i think that's 2005 or so where um i still remember seeing this front cover and it just kind of blew my mind that um it, there's no tangles right if you trace it's like a maze right if you trace this out you will see that there's never a situation where the dna overlaps or tangles itself. So any single given point of this, if I just grab it, say right here, oops, I can just pull this out and swivel it out, so to speak. And if there's important genes there, I can just pull them out and then put them back, right? So this was really, really uh, a breakthrough in understanding nuclear architecture. Okay, so uh, now this is something I do want you to know, and this is very simple. There's basically two kinds of chromatin. All right, so on the right here, you can see a pair of cells. Um, this is actually not a cell. This is just the nucleus of the cell, right? Stained in a very specific kind of stain that goes into the double helix called an intercalating agent. And you can see here that there's bright areas and dark areas, okay? So the really dim areas, they're dim because the DNA is loose and it doesn't really take up much of the stain. And we call that euchromatin or true chromatin, all right? This is where the DNA is free and available to be expressed. There's the genes for that cell that are active are there. Okay, the bright areas are the very densely staining areas. Those are called heterochromatin. More com excuse me, more compact, the DNA is not readily available. And so this is important in the regulation of gene expression. All right, so this is a really good summary I found uh, somewhere on the internet. And uh, I really liked it because it just shows in a really clean way the, the DNA double helix all the way to the nucleosomes, all the way to the solenoid, all the way to the loop domains, all right, and then on to the uh, different chromatin territories. And it really, uh, we from, I would say like from really, oh boy, I mean, right, right about there. I'd say this is the point where it, most of this is just speculative now. Okay, um, in terms of the, the fundamental structures. And then lastly, we have what we call the mitotic chromosome, which you guys have seen, the, you know, there's, there's one sister and there's another sister, okay? Here's another picture. This one shows the histone's tails. You can see the individual DNA molecule wrapping around the histones and then forming the 30 nanometer fiber. Here are your loops, okay? So we can see loops. We just don't know the, the higher orders of how the loops work. <clears throat> um, and a lot of books talk about three, you can say the 300 nanometer fiber, that's fine. Um, but again, the substructure from this point on is speculative. Okay, so that's DNA in a nutshell. I hope you uh, were able to pay attention and learn a bit, and hopefully it wasn't too boring. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post a comment or send me an email. My email is, um, <coughs> uh, I can't really write it here. It, my email is uh, a, uh, sorry, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W dot Ippolito, I-P-P-O-L-I-T-O, at bucks.edu. Okay, have a good night.